Um, but then I think it was last evening. Yeah, it was last evening. I saw some comments made by Dr. Robert Morey. Now, when I discovered, um, live on the air, the source of the nuke the Kaaba argument, the idea that you could, uh, that it's appropriate thing to have on the table. Uh, the destruction of the Kaaba as a means of dealing with Islam, which, by the way, if any Western power ever did that, would be the single most unifying thing that's ever brought all Muslims together that could ever be done. And from a Christian perspective, is just simply unthinkable, just absurd on its face. When live on the air, sitting in this room, wasn't as nice back then, but sitting in this room, I found out that Robert Morey was the source of that statement. There was a moment where I truly hesitated to continue to pursue the issue at all. To my, to my shame. Why do I say that? Because if I wanted to spend a good deal of time today about what I know about Robert Morey, it would take a while. Um, goes back a long ways, crown publications and things like that, all the way back in the late 1980s. And the first thought across my mind was, you don't want this spitting war, because that was exactly what it would be, is a spitting war. But I couldn't do that. Uh, it, it was brought out, quotation was there. And then it sort of went away. And then for some reason, back in November or so, um, Maury popped back up. He had been really underground for quite some time. And as I've explained, you know, before I did my first debate with Shabir Ali, some friends of mine, and I can bring them as, I can, I can have them as witness. Um, some friends of mine invited Maury to come to the debate and he said, oh, no, I need to go. James just uses all my arguments anyways. Well, I had never debated any Muslims. I debated Hamza Abdul Malik, but not on the subject of Islam. And I had not read Maury's books. Had them, but I had heard him give his Moon God presentation at a uh, apologetics conference in Philadelphia in, I think it was 93. I think it was 93 because um, I included a trip to my old hometown in Camp Hill in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, where I lived for six years as a part of that trip. And I think that was 1993. Anyway, after I, I can be forgiven if it was a year or two off one way or the other. But I did uh, hear his presentation and I didn't have anything really to compare it to, but there's just always been a attitude issue with, uh, with Dr. Morey for me. I've just never felt that he has the proper attitude in doing Christian apologetics. But I had never made a, a case for this. I had not attacked him. I just, just had decided that it wasn't, you know, uh, something that I wanted. He wasn't someone that I wanted to rely upon. I, it was just because of many things. Um, I just didn't follow after that. Well, Dr. Mori has uh, decided to start saying things about me. And I, again, I'm going to try to keep this brief. I am not going to uh, get into a war with the man because like I said, there's lots of stuff I could bring up. Lots of things we could go back to in past history that is not going to be edifying for anybody. Um, I did also criticize him, by the way, other than the Kaaba thing, I did criticize him for his be behavior in his debates with Shabir Ali and Jamal Badawi. And I, I stand by those criticisms. 
I do not believe that he acted in a way that adorned the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I think one of the main reasons I have never been able uh, to engage Badawi is because of the bad taste left in his mouth by his encounters with Robert Moore. Um, and I would be really nice if someone would communicate to him that I'm not like that. But anyway, he has begun to make statements. And the first one, this was, I believe, yesterday. Robert Moore, he is saying Muslims and Christianites. I'm just reading it. Worship the same God. Muhammad didn't send a child bride. Islam is peaceful. He is compromising with Islam. Now, it's very plain that Bob Morey's primary source of information is Sam Shamoon. And I believe that the reason that Sam Shamoon is behaving the way that he is and has, has, you know, people just can't understand how a matter of months ago he was saying very kind things about me. And now I'm just a, just, just a terrible, horrible person. I'm not the one that's changed. Um, I believe Sam Shamoon is attempting to prove his worthiness to his former mentor, uh, Robert Morey. That's, that's my theory. Um, and when you look at the incredible things that, that Sam Shamoon is saying, um, it's sort of a filtered and twisted version that ends up coming out in what Robert Morey is saying. So I, I think that's where the source is coming. It certainly can't go the other direction. So he is saying Muslims and Christians worship the same God. Now, on a factual level, anyone can go to the web, they can, they can pick up uh, my book, Whatever Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. They can go to the web. Remember, there was a big, uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, big discussion in culture about whether Muslims and Christians worship the same God. I put multiple videos out on the subject. And anyone who wants to be honest balanced, fair, um, knows that what I have said is the Quran says that we worship the same God. The Muslim claim is that the God that revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is Allah. So there is an identity between Yahweh and Allah. That's the Muslim claim. And so when we're talking simply about history, we need to recognize that's what the Muslims believe. And so we are all talking about that one God. But, and this is where, and see, once you get into the mindset of a Robert Morey or a Sam Shamoon, you only see on a page what you want to see on a page. Now, Sam Shamoon knows better. Sam knows. Sam didn't have any problem with the things I was saying. See, it's almost like he's deathly afraid that Robert Morey will realize that, that Sam and I really were friendly. When I was saying all the things that Sam now is is just attacking me right and left for. Um, but Sam knows, in his heart of hearts, you know this, Sam, you know this, that there is a second part of what I have said on this subject. And that is that in light of the fact that the author of the Quran does not understand the doctrine of the Trinity, does not understand what Christians believe, hence never provides a meaningful apologetic or argument against it. Which, by the way, is a major argument against the divinity of the Quran and therefore the entirety of the Islamic faith. Um, since in modern Sunni orthodoxy, Tawheed demands a Unitarian monotheism not, and cannot even allow for a Trinitarian monotheism, then no knowledgeable Christian in dialogue with a knowledgeable Muslim could ever say that the object of our worship is the same. We do not worship the same God. The statement found in the Universal Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church is in error when it says we adore. I think it's adoramus in the Latin. 
the same God. No, we do not. Because Christian worship, as clearly defined in the New Testament, as clearly seen in the book of Revelation, for example, as clearly seen in the Carmen Christi, Christian worship of necessity defines the object of our worship as including Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, which is precluded by any meaningful understanding of Tawhid in Islamic theology. Now, any honest person knows that that is what I have said and said for a long period of time. It's in print, it's on video, it's in debate, it's in lectures. There isn't any question about it. There's none. So why is Robert Morris saying, he is saying Muslims and Christians worship the same God? What's the motivation? Where, where, what's the origin? Um, it's not from truth. It's not from research. It's not attempting to, uh, to promote the Christian faith. You don't promote the Christian faith with falsehoods. Secondly, Muhammad didn't send a child bride. I don't know what that means. His, his material's filled with, it, it's, it's almost incoherent. It's filled with typographical errors. It doesn't even bother to take the time to, to make sure that it's, it communicates something. But Sam Shamoon has uh, posted material where, once again, one of the arguments that I have made, I have, again, it, my consistency over time is coming back at me here. Even back in the days when my focus was primarily upon Mormonism, and I can't call uh, Rich as a witness because Rich has now been proven to be an abject liar by AHA, so I can't I can't go there either. But he would tell you, though you can't believe him anymore, um, that you've never, in any of the conversations I've ever had with a Mormon on sidewalks, you've never heard me say to a Mormon, Joe Smith. I always say Joseph Smith. You may have never even noticed it. But you see, to me... I don't think I've ever said it because uh, you taught us... Why? Respect. Now, is it respect for Joseph Smith or respect for the Mormon? It's respect for the Mormon, it's not It's respect Joseph for the Mormon. You, you know, you've also taught us things like not hanging their underwear well, on duh. signs. Okay, that, that's real obvious. But, but did, you notice, did you notice about three minutes ago, I said the author of the Quran. I didn't say Muhammad. And people always ask me, why do you say that? Well, this is one of the major, major differences. And from the perspective of Robert Morey, Sam Shamoon, and others, this is compromised on my part. I want you to understand what this compromise is. I do, want, do not want to put any unnecessary emotional block in front of the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it might make me feel better or might make my people more excited. So when I'm talking to a Mormon, I'm not going to talk about Joe Smith, because they're going to take that as a sign of disrespect, not only toward Joseph Smith. I don't have respect for Joseph Smith as an individual. I believe that Joseph Smith is a false prophet. I believe that Joseph Smith sought to enrich himself um, through many schemes and introduced the whole subject of polygamy because he wanted to get in bed with a lot of women. Okay? I don't have respect for Joseph Smith as a religious leader. But in conversation with a Mormon, I don't need to bring that up. What I feel about Joseph Smith is irrelevant. I have higher values to be pursuing, which is keeping myself out of the way of a supernatural message called the gospel that I want to see used to bring about the salvation of the person I'm speaking to. And so I'm just not going to uh, give in to the temptation to make myself feel better or to make myself look better in front of other people by engaging that kind of disrespectful behavior. Okay? So when I talk about Muhammad, I'm going to talk about the, the author of the Quran because there are questions. There are meaningful questions about the origin of the Quran the collation of the Quran, uh, the redaction of the Quran, 
Could other people have been involved at later times? What was, was Uthman's role? There's all sorts of questions. So why immediately raise barriers by identifying, well, e and e even identifying Muhammad as the author of the Quran is offensive because the author of the Quran, um, theologically, from the Islamic perspective, is not Muhammad. He's just the passive channel through which it comes. The author of the Quran is Allah. And so when I point out that the author of the Quran did not understand something, that is the least offensive way I can say this book is in error. Think about it. I want them to think about it. There are many people that consider that abject compromise. To have in your mind the salvation of the person to whom you're speaking. And that's sad. That's sad. So, when it comes to the issue of Aisha, what I have said in the past is this is a practical, argumentative point. I have many, well, I used to say friends. Uh, they're proving that they weren't. Many acquaintances, people that I have met, people that I've worked with in the past that are now proving that they are not my friends at all. But I know many people who will begin their presentation by identifying Muhammad as a pedophile. I've never done that. I will never do that for one simple reason. I actually want my words to be heard by the people I'm talking to. And if you want to close their minds and get into a fist fight immediately, then go for it. And there are people like you out there. I'm sorry you ever thought I was one of you. I never was because you never heard me do that. What I have said is that when you look at the Quran, now see, I'm reasoning. And reasoning takes multiple sentences and paragraphs. And reasoning only takes place when... Well, um, emotion is not ruling the day. I'm trying to reason with you. And when we look at the Quran, the Quran shows absolutely no embarrassment. As far as I can tell, the Hadith shows absolutely no embarrassment in regards to Muhammad and Aisha. And in fact, now this could simply be due to the fact that um, Aisha becomes such an important uh, person in Islamic history, specifically during the period of time of the beginning of the collation and the writing down of Hadith. There, there's some historical possibilities there. Um, but the reality is that I think it is a significantly less emotionally charged and yet weightier issue to address the fact that the Quran shows tremendous embarrassment about Zainab bin Josh, not Aisha. So in other words, when you address the issue of Zainab, wow. Allah felt it was necessary to reveal an ins entire portion of, of a surah in the Quran to excuse Muhammad's marrying of the divorced wife of his adopted son. And in the process, destroyed the beautiful institution of adoption in Islam. I think that is a weighty argument. It doesn't immediately bring the emotional barriers and might actually be used to cause a person to sit back and to think about the prophethood of Muhammad. In other words, it's sort of like one, and again, here's this consistency thing. Um, I've often said when training people to deal with Jehovah's Witnesses, don't go to John 1.1. It's not there's something wrong with John 1.1. It's just that every Jehovah's Witness 
can answer John 1 1 in a comatose state. They don't need to think. They've heard it over and over and over again. Go somewhere they're not expecting. Colossians 2 9, for example, or or even better, the demonstration of Jesus being identified as Jehovah in Hebrews chapter 1 or in, in John chapter 12, verse 41, etc. It's 40 and 41. That kind of stuff. Go to places that that are going to cause the person that you're referring to to act that you're talking to to actually think. That's all I'm doing here. I have severe, severe concerns about what has happened as a result of Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. When people take Muhammad as the perfect man, as the paradigm of virtue, this has resulted in certain Muslim cultures, but not all, in certain Muslim cultures, and the very fact that I would dare to recognize that there, there's differences between the expressions of Islam, that's the other area of abject compromise. How dare you do that? They're all the same. Can't do it, sorry, because the facts are different. But in certain Muslim cultures, that has led to horrific abuses of child brides. There's no question about that. None whatsoever. But the fact, the, the fact that that's true, does that mean that in, I have to start every conversation with a Muslim on Muhammad with the accusation, with that accusation? Why? Well, it sure gets them angry. Well, if that's what you want, congratulations. That's not what I'm looking for. You and I have different reasons for what we do. You and I have different reasons. Um, so, uh, two, two of the statements so far from Robert Moore have been found to be, shall we say, somewhat less than truthful. Next, Islam is peaceful. Hmm. Well, anybody who's actually listened to what I am actually saying, see, it's real easy to misrepresent someone who tries to be fair with another group, especially when there are all sorts of different perspectives in that other group. So if you say these individuals over here are peaceful, like I, I, I can't imagine that anyone would argue that Ahmadi Muslims are not peaceful, but Sunni Muslims don't think they're Muslims. But I know the Ahmadi are there. And so if I say Ahmadi Muslims are peaceful, isn't that requiring you to recognize that there are different expressions of Islam? And because I recognize that someone like Yasser Khadi has put his life on the line to stand against ISIS, that makes me the compromiser because I recognize. In fact, I, if, uh, I even saw someone, and he knows who he is, identifying Yasser Khadi as a jihadi. I'm sorry, if you call him a jihadi, you're deceived. You're, you, 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 you can't deal with the reality in front of you. Your mind is warped. And that's a shame. You should, you should stop and consider, why is my mind warped? The statement, Islam is peaceful, assumes that there is a singular monolithic Islam. For how many years have I been pointing out that there is no singular monolithic Islam? For years. Are there peaceful Muslims? Yes, there are. They're there. Hello. Are there deep concerns that I have and have expressed over and over again with the fact that the Islamic sources contain? I mean, I could run the other room right now. Grab a book. $269, I think, from Brill, as I recall. It is the entire collection of Muhammad's battles. There is grave danger in the fact that Islam removes the truth about Jesus Christ as our mediator with God and substitutes in its teachings the man Muhammad. And because, and this has been a part of my presentations again for decades now, because Islam never had an Acts 15, the political and religious are joined together in any true expression of Islam. 
And that is causing tremendous difficulties, and it's very dangerous. And I don't believe that there is a consistent, unitary interpretation of the Hadith that can defeat Islamic radicalism, because I don't believe that that material is consistent with itself. It is the result of a process of evolution over time. And it wasn't guided by any one group. So there are contradictory strains within the Hadith. I don't know how anyone who's read them can argue this point, can argue against it. it is, it's, it's a given. It's as plain as the nose on your proverbial face. This is what I've been saying all along. This is what I've been saying all along. So he concludes, he is compromising with Islam. Dr. Mori, you are in error. You have given false testimony concerning an individual who is an elder in the church. You are wrong. You have now been corrected. Well, he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. He expanded later on. White says one thing to Christians and another thing to Muslims. That is a lie. Document it. The Muslims know that's not true. The Muslims that watch this program, and there are a number of them, know that what I am here is what I am in private conversation with them. That is a lie. This is the root problem. Those of us who debate Islam, who is that, Dr. Mori? You and Sam Shamoon? Who else? Those of us who debate Islam see white compromising. Then his ad hominem outbursts of name calling to Christian apologists is inexcusable. <laughs> who are you talking about? Um, did you switch, switch targets here to Sam Shamoon? Um, I'm not the one doing that. That's you guys. And this is, if you can't see that, this is, this is projection on a level that's, that I've almost never seen before in my life. You got one side living on Facebook, Sam Shamoon even grabbing AHA stuff, anything now, anything but the kitchen, including the kitchen sink is worth throwing at me. The, the level of incoherence and inconsistency on his part is shocking. But I'm the one engaging in ad hominem? Uh, okay. The Muslims use white's ad hominem videos on their sites to attack Christians. I saw one. And they were quoting my statement that Sam Shamoon can be, a, can be angry and foul-mouthed. You know what they did? They, they've got hours of this. They could produce a dozen videos of this. They just went to Pal Talk. And found, easily done, it's been, much worse examples have been sent to me in the past. This was actually rather tame. But they just kept repeating Sam behaving like a big bully in a Pal Talk chat room. Like that's never happened before. Everybody that knows him and knows him on Pal Talk knows that what I'm stating is a simple fact. It's not ad hominem. Stating documented facts is not ad hominem. Dr. Mori should know that. He should know what an ad hominem argumentation, uh, what ad hominem argument is. That's not ad hominem. It's a stated fact. I'm not the first person to say to Sam Shamoon, Sam, you have an anger problem. You have a temper problem. Everybody that knows him knows that it's true. Everybody that knows him. Now, I never sat around talking about it until he turned that anger upon me. But now he's done that. It's a fact. I've, I've said to him, Sam, you need to deal with this. Sam, you need, need to pray about this. Sam, you need pastoral assistance with this. And what do I get back? Well, there you go. Um, that is adding, it's, it's supposed to be aiding and abetting. It's adding and abetting the enemies of Christ. I don't care about his videos calling me stupid, ignorant, unchristian, etc. Um, what I said was that his argument about nuking the Kaaba is stupid, ignorant, and unchristian, and I stand by that. Notice he's taking what I said about what is obviously a ridiculous suggestion. 
and saying, oh, he's attacked me. Well, if you want to identify yourself with an argument like that, okay. I didn't do that. I called for you to abandon it. You've done good work in certain areas in the past, Dr. Mori. I hope that Dr. Mori would be able to recognize how imbalanced and absurd that argument about the Kaaba really is. I really do. Um, and then he starts to continue the, um, to repeat what he said. Then he said, I have tried to talk to him in private to no avail. When? When? Can, can, you, can you provide? When? When did you try to talk to me? You've, you've not contacted me. What are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, uh, what, what, what are you referring to? Do you know what he's referring to? Uh, no, no phone calls here. Maybe he's talking about those, uh, those, oh, those closed groups that he hangs out with and, and talking about you that you're not a part of. I, I don't no know. Idea. But he's never, ever written in here, emailed in here, or called here. Yeah, he says he responds publicly to any private disagreements. Um, here's, here's the last thing I'm going to say, and we're, we're going to, we're going to close up. Um, the people that support this ministry and support the work that we're doing are the people who fundamentally agree that we need to be focused upon the presentation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that that presentation needs to be one that is soaked in mercy and grace and love and it needs to be consistent trying to walk that line of not compromising and yet walking in the absolutely necessary realm of grace is not easy you are not looking at someone who claims to have done this perfectly i'm learning there are times in the past when i have not been as gracious as i should have been there's no question about that. And right now, it seems that what I'm being attacked for is daring to repent of that and trying to be one who does not put myself at the center. I've never been one that, I, I, look, there's been many times when there are arguments that occurred to my mind that would have been red meat for my followers, but I didn't throw them out there because they would have been disrespectful and would have been a, a barrier. But if there were times I didn't even see it, then that's for the Lord to deal with me and I repent of those things. The people who are going to believe the Robert Morris and Sam Shamoons of the world are going to be people who have not read my books, have not listened to the debates, who do not listen to this program regularly. I've seen some of them trying to interact with Sam before they get booted and banned and, and blocked and everything else because they're just amazed. Wait, wait a minute. You're, you're only taking a part of what he said and, and you're misrepresenting it. Boom, they're gone. Because the people who listen to this program know that I'm simply being consistent. And so when people start lying about me and Robert Morey is lying about me in public, then the only people that are going to continue supporting us are the people who know enough to analyze even false arguments and go, that's not true. That's not what he intended. That's not what he was doing. This is a gross misrepresentation. I cannot worry myself about the people who go, you know, you're right. I, I'm, I, I used to listen to that guy, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, okay. Nothing I can do about that. Because the cost of trying to keep those people is the cost of being consistent with my desire ultimately to see the gospel go out amongst, well, whatever group it might be. But in this case, we're talking about the Muslims. And you know what the sad fact of the matter is, folks? Most Muslims when they encounter a Bible-believing Christian, expect to be treated disrespectfully, not with love and mercy, because that's what they've experienced. Um, if you're a Muslim watching this, 
may I apologize for how many times Christians have joined with a proclamation of the truth an attitude that fundamentally was inconsistent with someone who themselves admits, I'm a sinner. I've only been saved by grace. I am no better than you are. I am no smarter than you are. For anyone who has approached you with an attitude that showed no respect for you as an individual, I apologize. And I hope you'll realize that there are many of us that want to have the opportunity of having spirited dialogue with you. We don't believe the same things. I want you to come to know the Jesus Christ I know. And that's not the Jesus of the Quran. The Jesus of the Quran is fundamentally a different thing than the Jesus of the Bible. And I believe he is your maker. And I believe he is your creator. You cannot view him merely as a prophet. I want you to come to know him. And I will seek to present him to you in such a way that is consistent with my profession that as his follower, I am absolutely dependent upon him, his mercy and his grace. I am better than no one else. I want you to, and if the only people that are going to continue supporting our outreach to the Muslims or to Roman Catholics or to Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or anybody else are people who agree with that perspective. If you're one of those folks that just wants to see theological swords drawn and theological blood flying, no. God's truth must be spoken within the context of grace for it to be used to accomplish his purposes. That's where we stand. So when you see lies on Facebook, and there are a lot of them out there right now, I hope you will simply take the time to think very carefully about where we have stood and how long we've stood there. This ministry has been around for coming up on 34 years. Some of the people attacking us haven't been alive for 34 years. We have a long track record. Uh, look at that. Not the most current out of context citation, or maybe even not even a citation by someone on Facebook. Facebook's a great thing in some ways, but in other ways, not so much, not so much. I hope that's helpful, and I hope the review of the debate was helpful. I'm going to try to get to the Trent Horn thing as soon as I can. We'll see. There's all sorts of other stuff that we haven't gotten to for weeks. We'll see what happens on the next edition of The Dividing Line. We'll see you then. God bless.